Okay, everyone, it's four o'clock. I think we'll get going. Um, good afternoon and welcome. And thank you for joining us for this webinar, considering challenges to age assessments for separated children and young people. Um, I'm Antonia Benfield. I'm part of the Doughty Street Chambers Public Law, Community Care, um, Immigration and Children's Rights teams. And I'm delighted to be joined by two excellent panelists this afternoon. Um, firstly, we've got Helen Johnson, OBE, who's head of the Refugee Council's Children's Services. Um, Helen has been um, for almost 25 years, I think, um, working with separated children and young people and overseeing um, what is the UK's only national um, asylum and welfare support service for separated children. Um, we're also joined by Edward Taylor, a solicitor at Osborne's Law, um, who works in both housing and social care and has particular expertise um, on age dispute claims and is a Lally's winner in the category of children's rights. So what we're going to do is divide the seminar up firstly with um, Helen speaking about the current landscape for age assessment claims, um, looking at some of the statistics and direction of travel, as well as um, some of the work that the Refugee Council does. And I will then do um, a, a chunk in relation to the current case law position um, before Ed will look at the in a kind of practical sense, best practice in preparing for age dispute claims. Um, we'll probably each speak for roughly 25 minutes and then there'll be plenty of times at the time at the end for questions and discussions um, as much as obviously we can achieve in the confines of a webinar um, but please do um, as we go throughout the session put any questions that you have in the Q&A and we'll do our best to deal with them at the end. Um, you'll of course note that your cameras and microphones are off this is a standard setting just to avoid interruption and um, inadvertent interference with the recording um, but please do feel free, we want to try and make this as collaborative as possible to put comments and questions um, in the Q&A. We are recording this webinar and both the PowerPoint and recording will be sent to participants after the session. Um, it will also be available on our website um, so that either you can um, use the PowerPoint slide as a tool afterwards or it can be shared with any colleagues um, for whom it would be helpful. Um, so I'll pass straight over to Helen, um, who's going to deal with our first section. Thanks, Antonia, um, and lovely to be here. Thank you all for attending. Uh, I probably won't talk for 25 minutes, but I will uh, talk a little bit about the work that we do in relation to age assessments uh, and some of the challenges. Uh, and anything I say is in the, the context of understanding that, that the vast majority of you on the call uh, are used to working with vulnerable people in very difficult circumstances. I do <laughs> appreciate that and understand it. I'm not imagining that this is all very new to you. Um, but just to talk about our role for a little bit, uh, we offer through the Refugee Council Children's Services a, a variety of services to unaccompanied children and young people. The largest of those services is, is what we call CAP, our Children's Advice Project. Uh, and through this, we do have a national contract, or so, I say national, England-wide, <laughs> uh, with the Home Office, uh, they fund us to offer support to any unaccompanied child who arrives in England. Uh, and some of that is direct work with the children. Some of that is uh, liaising closely with social workers uh, and solic immigration solicitors, mostly, and other professionals to ensure that unaccompanied children have the best possible support. One big thing for colleagues on this call to note is that since April this year, the Home Office has put a, a bar on our CAP project working on any, working proactively on any age matter. So prior to April, if we were concerned about age assessments, they could refer uh, internally to our own age dispute project, which I'll come to in a second, and externally to solicitors and others. But the current contract with the Home Office does not allow that since April this year. So I mentioned our age dispute project that does specifically, of course, work with people who we believe to be children, uh, but who've been assessed as adults, either by a local authority and or by the Home Office. Uh, that's the whole reason for them being in existence. Um, I just wanted to mention statistics uh, because they can, well, A, they're not enough of them, <laughs> but B, even where, where there are statistics, they're often misunderstood. So the Home Office themselves publishes statistics on age disputes, but these are very misleading. The, the numbers that the Home Office publish only refer to applicants 
who the Home Office isn't sure about their age, marks dispute on their paperwork, but refers to a local authority for assessment. Now, of course, we're worried about those clients uh, and do a lot of work trying to assist them, as do many of you in the room. But these statistics don't include a huge chunk of young people where the Home Office has stated in their view that they're over 25 and so they're not referring them to social services for support, they're treating them as adults and they'll remain in the adult systems uh, unless um, anybody intervenes. So that those numbers there on the link is just to a, a compilation of statistics which the Refugee Council produces quarterly based on Home Office stats, but it is only those who have been referred to local authorities as an age dispute, not all those where the Home Office has said they're 25 or over. Uh, we and some others I'm sure have repeatedly asked the Home Office to report on outcomes of age cases. Um, obviously we, we end up in a bit of a um, difficult dialogue with the Home Office where they think we always get it wrong and we think they always get it wrong. <laughs> and of course for all of us it'd be really helpful uh, to know, you know the outcomes of those cases where the Home Office has um, decided that somebody's either over 18 and in doubt or over 25. The Home Office say that they are collecting some of these statistics, uh, but they certainly haven't published them yet. And I'm straying into the realms of Donald Rumsfeld here, I think. We only know of the cases that we know of. We're not a statutory service. Uh, there's no published figures on how many age disputes are raised by the Home Office, by local authority, at what stage, and then how many of those young people whose age has been disputed are then accepted as children and at what stage. So a huge uh, gap there for, for us to keep asking the Home Office uh, to fill, uh, but for you all to be aware of. Our age dispute project stats, um, this, I mean, our age dispute project only has uh, le less than two members of staff. Uh, and just to give you a sense of uh, the pressures that we're under, uh, we took on 15 referrals in April, we took on 23 in May, and we took on 90 in June as numbers just increased exponentially. And of course, these cases are on top of already the uh, 1.8 colleagues are having a very large caseload, which they're already uh, trying to manage and work with solicitors and others uh, to make sure that those young people are getting the right attention, the right service, and are being um, referred back to local authorities and supported in their challenges. 2019-20 of the cases that we were working on during that year, so far, and these are numbers I took from last week, 135 of those cases we took on were accepted as children. Um, a couple of things to note on that, though that number increases every week <laughs> as more and more of the children we were working with last year are then accepted as children. And of course, uh, as noted in the previous slide, these are just the ones we know about. We don't know how many children are out there being treated as adults that nobody's helping. We don't know how many people out there have been helped by others and are now uh, treated as children. I want to just make a quick plea for um, recognition of good practice out there. Um, in my experience, there are very many social workers across the country doing an excellent job uh, in very challenging circumstances. Uh, age assessments can be difficult for social workers uh, and a lot of them go into it with good intention, uh, often with little support in terms of resources and management support uh, and do a good job. Uh, by definition, the cases that come to you uh, are, are where things have gone wrong. So it's just a, a usual plea to recognize that there are other professionals out there doing a good job where they can. And of course, we are working with, well, thousands of children across the country every year through our different services. Not all the young people we meet know their own age. And of course, not all of them, all of them will tell the truth about their age for very good reasons, um, but that's where we are with it. And we will uh, reject referrals uh, sometimes. Uh, and as I've noted there, we would be asking for, from all of us for a humane but robust approach. It doesn't do, um, individuals or the wider issue, uh, any good service to promote claims by people to be under 18 when they're not under 18. If we reject a referral, and I'll um, 
sadly we'll be rejecting quite a lot in the coming weeks because of capacity issues if we reject a referral. In almost all circumstances, it is just around our capacity. Uh, but there will be occasions where we've met with somebody uh, and we don't feel that we can actually support uh, their claim to be under 18. Or it might be that actually we do think that they're under 18, but the circumstances mean that it's just so highly unlikely that they're going to be successful uh, that we feel we can't dedicate resources to it. So, you know, an example of a, of a case we had a little while ago of somebody who had said that they were adult uh, in other European countries that said they were adult on arrival here to several people at different times and then came to us and said they were a child. We believe they could well be a child, but they were about to turn 18. We had very limited resources. We didn't feel that it was a good use of those resources um, to help that young person in that scenario. Very sad uh, for them, uh, but that's sadly the re reality that we're working in. So what do we actually do if we're involved? The focus of all our work across all our children's services uh, is the best interest, best interests of that young person. Uh, and of course, lots of arguments about what those best interests might be, but that's uh, the principle that we're aiming for. In relation to age cases, uh, very often difficult decisions need to be made. Uh, and one of these is around whether or not to settle a case. And my uh, legal colleagues might uh, be able to share more detail with you on this. Um, settling a case which gives the child the wrong age can be really, really difficult for them and damaging for them. But occasionally we will feel that on balance, that can be the right thing to do. Because if the alternative is a very lengthy court case uh, that might uh, end up with a, a more damaging scenario for that young person. Age cases can be resolved within hours, but some of them can take months and more than a year to resolve. And obviously those, these are potentially, potential protracted delays can really impact on the, the young person's life in all sorts of ways. The most obvious way for most of the young people we work with is in relation to their asylum application. Uh, and in many cases, the Home Office won't make a decision on the asylum application if the age has not been resolved. Uh, and for many young people, maybe set, if they're claiming to be 16, for example, settling to agree that they're 17, which means they will then get a grant of asylum as a child, uh, might be the better course of action than fighting uh, to, to argue over that year. And of course, these delays have, have all sorts of other impacts. Um, Memory is something I could happily talk for hours about, but of course, very difficult for a child to keep remembering all the details they've said to this professional and that professional over protracted periods in different settings. Um, the impact of delay on the young person's mental health and any of you involved in working with these young people, I'm sure will have seen this, where young people are waiting, whether it's for an age decision or an asylum decision, uh, and how that can really, really have a detrimental impact on their well-being. Um, Credibility, and that is, of course, uh, connected to the point of memory where different information comes to light at different times um, and how that can really impact on whether they're believed by different professionals uh, and just getting on with life, just getting into college, settling down, feeling that they can move on uh, can be the way to go uh, rather than fighting for, for a, a case that you may or may not win down the line. So we're seeking often with, with you guys uh, and the young person to, to explore from the start where the cases should be settled. And, and again, at any opportune moment, there will be different moments throughout the progress of the case. And uh, Antonio and Ed, I'm sure, will be referring to this where settlement might be possible and preferable. Just in relation to that uh, point about asylum decisions, this is um, the links to the Home Office's own uh, policy or process guidance, sorry, on assessing age. Uh, and the quote from that, from the Home Office, if the age of the applicant is material to the decision on claim, that decision must be delayed while the age remains outstanding. So yeah, we've seen many children waiting huge lengths of time for an asylum decision because the age is still an issue. My screen seems to have frozen, so apologies. Um, Nothing's happening at my end. Um, Ray, if you're able to take over, that's great. Uh, but I can keep talking. 
Um, I'll just talk through, there's only a couple more slides, so I'll talk to them uh, while Ray tries to sort out any technical issues. Um, so when we're taking on an age dispute case, uh, we will uh, meet with the young person and take a view. And obviously we might be wrong. <laughs> uh, and certainly we sometimes disagree amongst ourselves over whether we think somebody is under 18 or over 18. That's the difficult nature of this line of work. Where a young person comes to us and has no local authority assessment, so they've only been disputed by the Home Office. Those cases can sometimes be very quickly and easily resolved by a referral to the local authority where that child is there and then. Uh, and in, in many cases, the local authority uh, meets the young person, acknowledges that they are indeed a child and takes them into their care. Uh, and that's um, the easy case is done. Um, but of course, if the local authority has already undertake an assessment or then undertakes an assessment and decides that a young person is adult, uh, then in almost all cases then we will need uh, help from a legal representative to tackle that local authority decision. There's a small handful of local authorities who will relook at a decision if, if we just go back to them, but in almost all cases we'll need your help. If we're at that stage uh, working with a young person who's got legal representation on the issue of their age, then we will be offering to act as litigation friend for that young person. Um, through, I mean, obviously there are, there are legal responsibilities attached to that role as litigation friend, uh, but also we will want to be playing a wider role, liaising closely with yourselves and the young person uh, to ensure that the right decisions are made at the right time and that the young person is involved in that and understands what's happening to them. Trying to manage the frustrations of the young person uh, as the inevitable delays ensue. If the case then goes to court, then uh, preparing the young person for court with yourselves, preparing ourselves for court. Uh, it might be that we're just there to support the young person. It might be that we're in fact then involved in uh, a witness, being a witness ourselves. If the case has gone to court and um, the hearing is successful and the young person is accepted as their claimed age, uh, then of course that's just brilliant for everybody and uh, some of those moments uh, being with a child when they find out that the age is accepted are, are some of the highlights of our work but conversely of course uh, sometimes the courts don't agree and we have to have very very difficult and distressing conversations with young people to explain to them that their age has not been accepted and of course for some very serious uh, ramifications afterwards in terms of their support uh, their asylum decision and what happens to them next and using as far as our capacity allows, uh, the information gathered through this work to try and influence policy and practice at local levels with individual social workers, with teams, with colleagues, uh, and working through up to national level, uh, where, for example, our policy manager will be talking to officials within the Home Office and the Department for Education, trying to grab them in this, uh, to try to influence policy and practice. Um, not much hope uh, with the uh, current proposals from government about making positive change, uh, but we'll do our best. And then lastly from me, uh, what the future will bring in this area? No obvious solution, largely because there's no medical test anywhere in the world that can accurately tell somebody's age. I, I'm sure one day the scientists will come up with this, hopefully in my lifetime. <laughs> Uh, but at the moment, there isn't a test to tell how old somebody is. Hence the need for um, clear guidance for everybody and an acceptance of doubt. And this, this feels like a conversation that I've been having with people for 25 years. We have to accept that sometimes we won't know how old somebody is. We have to do our best to get as close as we can to the right age. Um, and of course, solicitors, barristers and others on this call play an absolutely crucial role in this development of a good practice by all of us uh, and holding us all to high standards. I think the main thing I've skipped in this uh, brief presentation is the unfortunate uh, update on our age dispute project uh, because we will have to close to new referrals very shortly. Uh, you saw from the stats how overwhelming it is for the 1.8 colleagues on that project. Uh, so sadly, we will stop taking new referrals uh, and we'll be announcing that in the coming days, uh, but hopefully we'll soon be back uh, and ready to take on as many as we can. 
Thank you for your attention so far. I'm going to hand over to Antonia now, uh, as she has said, any comments and questions in Q&A and we'll all be here at the end to pick that up. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it went on to screen sharing before I was able to get myself off mute. Um, thank you, Helen. That was incredibly helpful um, and a really useful introduction. Um, I'm going to pick up on some of those points as I work through um, essentially kind of five areas, um, looking at the current position of case law and guidance um, and some of the issues that we're facing in age dispute claims. Um, the first is a reasonably simple um, one, I mean, in a sense, um, where cases may be easiest, not in terms of the work that's involved and the preparation of the claim, but in terms of the legal issues, um, is where a full age assessment has been conducted um, and one is considering it alongside the framework um, to determine whether it's a Merton compliant assessment and whether there is a, a, a challenge to it. Um, and of course, what is termed as Merton compliance is really a, a term of art, which is accepted as meaning more um, than the principles that were laid down in the case of being the London Borough of Merton back in 2003. And there have been a range of cases that have looked at restating the legal framework, essentially the, the components um, that are required for a lawful Merton compliant age assessment. Um, but most recently that was done by Mrs Justice Thornton in the case of AB and Kent County Council. Um, we'll come back to look at this case in a bit more detail shortly when looking at short form age assessments, um, but it's a, a helpful go to really um, when looking at the, the fundamental principles. Um, as I say, I'm not going to dwell on this um, in any particular um, degree because you'll have it in the handout. Uh, and as I say, where cases potentially become more complex is when one is falling outside of the, the full age assessment. Um, but we can see from here, you know, a restatement of principles that Helen's referred to, the importance of the benefit of the doubt um, and looking at the burden of proof, um, some guidance in relation to physical appearance and demeanor, and then in terms of the procedural fairness requirements, so in the conduct of the age assessment um, and decision making. So, um, as I say, although principles are restated in a, a number of cases, this is probably um, the most comprehensive um, and most recent. So I want to look then at, at short form assessments because this is an area where there has been quite a bit of development in case law and they're cases that um, often cause us quite a lot of difficulty in knowing whether there is scope to challenge um, a short form assessment. Uh, short form assessments have, have always existed um, in some form um, and they've been accepted since the time of Bean Merton as being permissible. And I think we'd all have to properly accept that in certain cases, a social worker is entitled to determine that a full age assessment is not required um, because someone is very obviously well into adulthood. Um, and really that comes from the case of Bean Merton that you've got um, there. Um, where the court said in certain cases it will be very obvious that a person is either over or under 18. Um, and in an obvious case where phys a physical appearance alone can justify a determination that a person is an adult. Of course, the difficulty comes from um, what is meant by obvious and um, really because that is a subjective assessment. It's, of course, informed by other contextual matters such as upbringing, a young person's experience or trauma, for example, or country conditions, um, which may not be explored in any great depth um, in the course of a short form assessment. There are a range of terminology that I've set out at the, um, the top of the slide, um, which kind of confuse the issue, but I, I, I prefer the term short form assessment, but sometimes we see you know, abbreviated assessments, eyes on assessments, initial screening assessments, Merton light age assessments, um, but really all come down to the same thing, um, which is an abridged process where some or all um, of the procedural safeguards that are outlined um, in, in Merton, in the Merton compliant framework, um, are, are not employed. In reality, what a short form assessment can look like can vary greatly. 
Um, it can be a very brief interview while a person is detained in police custody or in a short um, short term holding facility. Um, and where or um, where an assessment is conducted over a, a number of sessions, potentially after a putative child has been in the local authorities' care. Um, so they vary in terms of level of inquiry, um, they vary in terms of circumstances. Um, and that's why um, breaking down really what's required at a kind of baseline of procedural fairness and decision making. I think is important for all of us when looking at the routes to challenge um, short form assessments. And it's notable from the ADCS guidance, so of course that's the Associate Directors of Children's Services guidance, um, which remains since 2015 um, the core best practice guidance for social workers, um, that short form assessments will be rare. Um, I think in reality we all appreciate that they're in fact common. Um, and what I want to then think about is the range of cases which start to give us a framework in terms of what short form assessments um, should look like. So the first was the case of BF Eritrea. This is a case in the Court of Appeal, so 2019, um, where the court was considering the Home Office's policy um, for immigration officers, so not social workers, but the Home Office, um, assessing a young person's age for the purpose of their asylum claim. Um, so this is where they're claiming to be a child, but their age was doubted. And at that time, the Home Office's policy um, applied a threshold under which um, the Home Office was entitled to dispute age, where physical appearance and demeanour very strongly suggests that they were significantly over the age of 18. That aspect of the policy, so significantly over 18, was found to be unlawful um, as it failed to take account of the margin of error in age assessments generally. Um, and that's accepted in a range of guidance and cases as being as much as five years either side. Um, so the court didn't consider that significantly over 18 signif sufficiently accommodated for that margin of error. The Home Office has since withdrawn and amended their policy as Helen mentioned earlier um, so we now have significantly over 25. The Supreme Court, I think it was on the 16th of March, heard the Secretary of State's appeal against that decision um, and the judgment is awaited. Um, essentially, the Home Office arguing that they were entitled to employ a significantly over 18 threshold. And um, we'll have to see what the Supreme Court says about it, but for the moment, um, it, it's, it's only where physical appearance indicates someone's over 25 that the Home Office should dispute age. The case is helpful, so BF Eritrea, where, for example, a local authority has assessed a person in a short form assessment, largely on appearance and demeanour, but come to the conclusion that they say 20, 21, 22. Um, it's helpful then to take the court back in a challenge to that, looking more broadly at the margin of error, um, including in BF Eritrea. So the second case um, is the case of AB and Kent County Council that I mentioned earlier, where the court considered the lawfulness of abbreviated local authority um, age assessments. And really two core points come out of AB and Kent. The first is reiterating the importance of the tame side duty. Um, so namely the duty to undertake sufficient inquiry to inform a decision. Um, really has the local authority asked itself sufficient questions, um, asked sufficient questions of the young person to determine their age. Um, of course, the duty isn't a fixity, but it's a, a useful point um, to refer to where you, for example, have a very quick decision um, and really very little questioning um, about the background and circumstances of a young person where physical appearance and demeanor are relied upon. The second important point that came out of AB is the importance of social workers taking account of the margin of error in assessments generally, so linking the findings in BF and AB, um, but also that social workers must expressly address the margin of error, that they've turned their mind to it. Um, and the court linked this back to the importance of the benefit of the doubt principle um, and the unreliability of age assessments generally. And so in that case, um, the local authority had found um, after a short form assessment that AB was between 20 and 25 years old. 
um, and the court considered that was too close to the margin of error to be um, reliable. Um, and what happened is that, that after permission was granted, the case was transferred to the upper tribunal for a fact-finding hearing. Um, and Kent was also required to conduct a full Merton compliant age assessment. The third case we then come to is a case of H.J. and Croydon. And actually this was a section 20 case opposed to a direct challenge to an age assessment decision. Um, but the court observed when considering a short form assessment that had been conducted by another local authority before H.J. moved into Croydon's care, um, that there must have been um, sufficient doubt as to whether that initial short form age assessment was case law compliant. Um, and the court identified a number of factors that they considered um, should have at least raised doubt, um, which was the fact that there was no recognition of the margin of error, that the purpose of the age assessment hadn't been explained to the young person, that there were insufficient adequate reasons, there was no minded to process and there was no appropriate adult. So the case of HJ is actually quite helpful in looking at how one transposes some of the procedural fairness requirements from the Merton compliant framework um, into a short form assessment. The final case that I just wanted to refer to um, is a case of Kay and Milton Keynes Council. Um, and this is one that's regularly cited by local authorities, so useful just to, to consider it for a moment. Um, it was an interim relief judgment where um, an age assessment had been conducted at the police station of K. It was largely based on physical appearance and he was considered to be significantly over 18. So the court refused interim relief um, and it was Mr Justice Pepperell who held that the full rigours of the Merton compliant process um, were not required in what he termed um, a clear and obvious case where there is no doubt on ad adulthood. Um, now, subsequently, and prior to permission, Milton Keynes, um, in fact, undertook a Merton compliant age assessment and accepted age such that the claim was withdrawn. Um, so it, it's a useful point, and if it ever assists anyone, this becomes an issue in their case to have the order that dealt with the settlement of proceedings um, to potentially refer to the fact that, in, in fact, this case doesn't support that short form assessments lead to accurate conclusions on age. Um, but in fact serve to emphasise the unreliability of short form assessments. Um, so just then to recap on kind of what fairness looks like in a short form assessment. Firstly, it has to depend on the facts of the case. There is no kind of fixity in what, in what is required. But in all cases, I think it's appropriate to say that the purpose of the age assessment should be explained to the young person on grounds of fairness. They have to under know, understand what they're there, there for. Um, and what the purpose is of the local authority questioning them. If credibility is an issue, so it's not a case which is you know, merely physical appearance, demeanor, or for example, you know, a Eurodac search or information that someone has been um, treated as an adult or claimed to be an adult in another country, um, adverse points should be put to them. And they should have an opportunity to respond to provisional conclusions. I think in all cases, we would say the tame side duty has to apply, the local authority has to um, ask sufficient questions to come to an informed decision, um, and a suitable interpreter has to, be, has to be provided, so that's both language and dialect under the ADCS guidance, and that the age assessment is in a suitable location. Um, it's useful on this point to look at both the ADCS guidance and the joint working guidance, which is that between the Home Office and local authorities, um, which both state that age assessments, for example, in police stations will not be case law compliant. Um, sometimes I think it's appropriate to argue that an appropriate adult is required. Um, and in most cases, that information from other sources, such as country information, should be considered. Um, on the point of an appropriate adult, you know, sometimes there are cases where there is someone who is highly vulnerable and um, suffers from mental health problems, has been a victim of trafficking or, for example, sexual abuse on their journey. Um, and in those types of cases where they're being questioned on traumatic history, um, I think appropriate to argue um, that the local authority at least should have considered whether an appropriate adult should have been provided. Um, so in terms of challenging, what do we do with short form assessments? Of course, you know, one route not going to litigation is try to persuade the local authority to conduct a full assessment and take the young person into care um, in the interim. 
Of course, that's the easiest route. Um, that's the one that's likely to cause less delay for the young person and get their you know, needs and um, safeguarding um, met. Um, and that can be done by a challenge to the short form assessment itself or providing, for example, um, further evidence in terms of a detailed statement from the client setting out information that the local authority would have gathered if they'd asked um, sufficient questions. Um, one could bring a challenge to the short form assessment um, on the basis that it, a Merton compliant age assessment was required, so it wasn't lawful or rational for the local authority just to conduct a short form assessment. Um, but as we saw from the case of AB and Kent, one can also um, rely on the case of A and Croydon, um, so invite the court to exercise jurisdiction to determine age um, for itself. The threshold under the determination of age, A, A and Croydon, of course, is lower and permission is more achievable. Um, so I think in, in each case, one needs to consider you know, what is appropriate on the basis of the claim. I suppose if one had, for example, a short form assessment and then thereafter a young person obtains a copy of their birth certificate or passport, um, it wouldn't be appropriate to go straight to litigation. One would put that back to the local authority um, and ask them to conduct a full assessment. Um, but as I say, and it's a point reiterated by Helen, um, delay is a real factor um, and it causes lots of detriment. Um, and it's important looking at the kind of most appropriate, um, but the route that causes the least amount of delay. So the next kind of topic that I wanted to come on and look at, um, Helen's also briefly touched upon, and that's home office age assessments. So, of course, the Home Office is often the first authority that will meet with a putative child and is likely to conduct an initial decision on age, um, either for the purpose of kind of asylum routing and or taking a decision to detain under immigration powers. Um, and the Home Office age assessments are governed by the assessing age policy. Um, and what that says in summary is that the Home Office can treat a person claiming to be a child as an adult on three grounds. So the first is where a local authority Merton compliant assessment finds them to be 18 years of age or over, um, and the Home Office has accepted that. Um, the second we've already considered, so this is where two um, Home Office members of staff consider physical appearance and demeanor very strongly suggest that they're 25 years of age or old, older. Or thirdly, where there's credible and clear documentary evidence that they're 18 years of age or older. But if none of those apply, the child should be referred to a local authority and the subjects of a Merton compliant age assessment. Of course, the statutory guidance on unaccompanied migrant children and child victims of trafficking, which is the November 2017 guidance, um, states that a person should be treated as a child pending a case law compliant assessment. So that should include the provision of Section 17 and Section 20 Children Act support and accommodation. The Home Office decisions are often um, very quick decisions um, and partially because they're quick and partially because they're often conducted just as a young person has arrived in the UK so often you know exhausted confused traumatized um, there is a high, high margin of error the home office decision makes clear um, that their decision so the home office assessment on age is not intended to prevent a young person from approaching a local authority um, Often, as a result of that, Home Office decisions are not the subject of challenge in and of themselves, because after a Home Office decision, someone will be referred to a local authority, um, and it will be the local authority who forms the focus of the challenge if they refuse to act on that referral. But it can be appropriate in certain cases to um, challenge the Home Office decision itself, if, for example, it's led to um, a decision to detain or an inadmissibility decision under the immigration rules, um, but it can also be appropriate to include the Home Office as a second defendant in a claim or as an interested party if, for example, they are relying on a local authority age assessment that is wrong or if they are accommodating someone that um, we say is a putative child. Um, the next kind of topic which falls under Home Office assessments that I wanted to consider is um, the Kent Intake Unit specifically. So at Kent Intake, of course, this is one of um, the intake units where asylum claims are processed. There's a distinct policy that's called the Kent Intake Unit Social Worker Guidance, um, under which the Home Office has embedded social workers, so employed by the Home Office, who conduct short form assessments at Kent Intake. So this is a policy that's only been in existence since September 2020. 
um, and as I say, doesn't relate to other intake units, specifically Kent. Um, and again, these are often quite short assessments, roughly 30, 45 minutes. Um, they'll be um, unlikely for there to be an appropriate adult there. I don't think I've yet seen one where Kent Intake has put an appropriate adult in place. Um, often a telephone interpreter is used um, and a specific decision will be made on how old the young person is. So not just over 25, but a, an age and date of birth. And very commonly, they lead to decisions that the young person is younger than 25 years old, um, but over 18. And this has led to um, a case that is um, pending in the admin court at the moment. So post permission um, and substantive hearing at the um, kind of towards the end of October of this year, um, looking at whether that policy construct is lawful. Um, and maybe taking the cases of MA and HT, so um, both of them claiming now to be 17 years of age, one found to be 20, one found to be 21 after KIU age assessments. So thinking back to the Home Office policy on assessing age and the basis under which they can treat someone as an adult, um, the KIU assessment isn't a local authority Merton compliant age assessment. They in fact say on the face of them they're not intended to be Merton compliant assessments. And of course, they're not assessments that find someone to be 25 years of age or older. Um, so what is being considered in this case is the incompatibility between the Kent intake guidance and the overarching age assessing policy um, and whether this particular construct at Kent um, is lawful. There's also an issue about um, detention because often um, young people are detained. Um, either at KIU or um, an immigration removal centre nearby before going to KIU, um, and then they will be age assessed there. They could then be detained thereafter before they get dispersed in the NAS estate. Um, and so it, it kind of brings into question whether there is a lawful decision to detain um, on the basis that there has been no case law compliant um, age assessment. So these are all issues that the High Court will look at in the case of MA and HT. Um, but I think they're helpful to keep in mind when you're looking at local authority age assessments, because quite regularly you see cases coming through where um, an age assessment will have been done by KIU. Um, and then in an on referral to the local authority, um, the local authority may say, as in fact Coventry City Council did in this case, that they weren't legally responsible to conduct an age assessment because they had already been age assessed by Kent County Council. Now, that position is flawed um, because KIU assessments are not Kent County Council. They're very um, clear that they are home office in terms of both the employment of the social workers and the responsibility for decision making. Um, but this is a misapprehension that arises in a number of cases because there is inconsistent recording on IS 97M, so the home office decision on age, um, which doesn't make expressly clear that these are Kent intake unit assessments. And I think I've seen you know, various wording used, either a local authority assessment conducted by the Home Office, a local authority assessment conducted by an independent social worker, or an age assessment conducted by Kent County Council. So that leads to an ambiguity when we're looking to challenge these decisions, both for lawyers who are advising in the early stages, but also um, for local authorities themselves. So the next topic I want to look at um, is interim relief um, and just to look at a couple of questions um, really kind of when one should be applying for interim relief in age dispute cases, what we should be seeking um, and what are the kind of standard lines of defence from local authorities. Um, in my view, in most cases, it is appropriate to apply for interim relief um, and the decision is whether to seek that in advance of a decision on permission um, or to seek expedition um, and abridgement so that a decision is made at the time um, that a permission decision is made. Um, and I think it's, I mean, it's of course important noting at the bottom, you know, the Hamid jurisdiction and what the court has recently said in DVP uh, and also in the recent case that came out last week um, is we have to be mindful of the use of the urgent applications procedure. So it's important to reality test your case. You know, can it really be said if, for example, you sought abridgement for 14 days for acknowledgement of service and seven days for the court to consider the applications, could your client um, properly say that 
he needed an order outside of that period. And I think that that leads to a consideration of a number of factors, you know, how long or kind of accommodation position firstly, and how long someone has been in that accommodation. If you have someone, for example, who's been in accommodation for the last six months and you're able, unable to point other than to the fact that they are not receiving support to which they'd been entitled and they're you know, generally not being treated as a child. If you can't point to particular um, issues in the accommodation, you may struggle with an urgent application. Um, also delay in bringing a claim can be relevant. So if it's, it's a case that's taken you know, potentially for very good reasons in obtaining statements or um, supporting statements, you know, can you really say um, that it's appropriate to um, ask the court to consider before the local authority has had a chance to respond. Um, but of course, there are cases where some clients are particularly vulnerable, either by their you know, personal features, their experiences, or their accommodation. Um, so as I say, just important to kind of reality test and have a think about um, the various factors. So in most cases, we'd be asking for a mandatory order that a young person is um, accommodated and supported under the Children Act in accordance with their claimed age. Um, and that can accommodate after somebody turns 18. So for example, where they are um, then entitled to leaving care support. Um, and just a further point is that it's important once the order has been granted to keep an eye on the local authorities discharge of the order. So whether in fact they are treating the young person as a child under section 17, section 20, in terms of the support, kind of the nature of the accommodation and what they're getting in terms of financial support um, and what they're getting in terms of education provision. So then looking at standard lines of defence, and I think these are, are pretty common in terms of what local authorities will say to um, combat an application for interim relief. So firstly, costs, you know, local authorities understretched, um, it would be detracting funding from others who are um, in need of local authority um, services. And on occasion, you know, the court is sympathetic to that, of course, it would be accepted that local authorities are, are under huge pressure. Um, but it's a question of balancing that when um, looking at all the factors in the round. Another point that's often raised is the risk of accommodating your client with other young people. Um, so the local authority will say, you know, they have safeguarding duty to other young people in the placement. Um, and what we're told by guidance, so this is the ADACS guidance in other cases, um, is that, you know, there are um, supervisory, supervisory measures in place whereby the local authority can kind of manage and mitigate that risk. Um, other points that are made is that, you know, if they're in NAS initial accommodation, for example, that it's, you know, it's not that bad, it gives them sufficient safe accommodation, um, or that your client um, is somewhat old, you know, an older child, so maybe 17 years of age. I'm conscious of time, and I'm not going to then therefore dwell on any of these cases in particular detail. Um, but what I've set out here are the kind of core authorities on this first page um, when looking at the approach to um, interim relief. And then we've had, I mean, I think as a benefit of um, the pandemic and the court um, recording more cases with a transcript, we've had a run in 2021 of recent decisions on interim relief. Um, so this just gives you a snapshot, both pre-permission and post-permission of the factors that the court has looked at. Um, in, for example, the case of AH, that was a case where AH turned 18 just prior to the interim relief hearing, and still interim relief was granted acknowledging leaving care um, and how important that is, um, and other factors that the court have looked at. And I think when you're kind of reality testing your case and also preparing your evidence, um, it's useful to keep those um, factors in mind. So the final case that I want to look at, and I think is particularly relevant now because many young people if they've been accommodated by the local authority and then support terminated, will end up in NAS hotels. Um, and also they may end up there after they've been age disputed by the Home Office. And so this was a case, um, NG and others in the London Borough of Hillingdon that was heard in the autumn of last year. And the court was um, considering both permission and interim relief in this case. Um, the hearing then settled post permission with Hillingdon accepting um, a children act duty to the young people pending an age assessment. Um, but what is helpful is um, to look at what the court said were the issues with NAS accommodation for children, both in terms of safeguarding and training and, and support provision, um, and also the risk of dispersal um, and the absence of support that they're receiving. So I think these are just 
helpful observations to work through when preparing um, either a statement or pleadings um, in one of such cases. So the final um, kind of chunk that I wanted to deal with briefly, and I'm going to um, run through them quite quickly because I know Ed is going to have a look at um, fact-finding hearings in his presentation as well, um, but just to deal with it shortly. So after a grant of permission, of course, a case is usually transferred to the upper tribunal. There can be odd cases where the admin court will retain a case for fact-finding in the high court, um, but the vast majority of cases will go to the upper tribunal. And it's important just thinking kind of procedurally to keep in mind that the CPR doesn't directly apply in the upper tribunal. The upper tribunal has its own procedure rules and practice directions. And there is now quite a standard case management framework for cases post permission. So essentially a case gets transferred, standard directions are issued, um, parties are required to comply with them, um, and then a case management hearing will be listed. At the moment, we still have um, hybrid cases. So what the tribunal is doing is that the applicant and any other person who requires an interpreter will come in person and others will attend remotely. I, I think the other tribunal has said they're looking from October onwards to kind of resume full in-person hearings. Um, the kind of primary focus in fact-finding hearings um, is often on the account that the young person gives. Of course, there can be cases with very strong supporting evidence, documentary evidence, expert evidence. Um, but in many cases, it comes down to um, how the young person explains themselves in front of a judge and what they say about their knowledge of age. Um, and as I said, Ed's going to come on to looking at best practice. But just to reiterate at this stage, this is why it is so important to have a really detailed witness statement going into a fact finding hearing, because your client's account could be, you know, half of the hearing in terms of how it's tested. Um, the tribunal is in general kind of very careful not to stray into the territory of determining a young person's asylum claim. Um, but even if the central facts of their asylum claim are not being decided, of course, an adverse credibility finding could affect them. Um, it's important, therefore, to keep in mind as part of the you know, general um, approach to thinking how one can settle or kind of deal with these cases more efficiently is that the first tier tribunal, when they consider um, a, an as asylum claim, can also determine age. And the case that I've cited at the bottom, um, Rawafi, is a case that confirms that the standard of proof when the first tier tribunal is determining age is on the lower asylum standard, so um, the reasonable degree of likelihood. And that, of course, contrasts with the upper tribunal who is determining age um, on the balance of probabilities. So it's important to consider whether it's in the client's best interest to proceed with seeking a determination from the upper tribunal. Of course, that is a judgment in REM. It binds every authority thereafter. And there can be cases where actually it is um, more effective um, for the young person to pursue the claim in the course of their asylum case. Um, and one case that I can think of as a kind of illustrative example was one where the age dispute directly arose as a result of documents upon which um, the young um, female client in that case um, said that she had been trafficked into the UK on. And so the documents giving rise to the age dispute, of course, were kind of inextricably linked with her asylum and trafficking claim. And in that case, of course, it would be artificial to look at the weight that could be placed on documents divorced from a determination of asylum and trafficking. Um, so that was a case where it was more appropriate um, to go on and consider um, withdrawing a claim in the upper tribunal and allowing it to run its course in the first tier. Um, so just to conclude, kind of reiterating what Helen said, of course, there is a duty on all of us, um, as in all public law claims, to um, continually consider merits. That, of course, does change through the various stages of disclosure, um, and it's also critical to explore routes of settlement. I think there is something quite unattractive um, for lawyers in terms of advising on settlement of age. Um, it's easier to advise on settlement if it's something financial, but um, where it's you know, the identity of a young person, I think many of us are quite cautious. Um, but as Helen said, you know, there are cases where that really is in a young person's best interests. Um, and I think it's important kind of at every stage to look at how one preserves 
their own kind of personal integrity, the stress, the strain of going through the process, their asylum claim, but also their entitlement to Children Act support. So that's me done and I'll pass over to Ed. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Antonia. Um, so when I was thinking about my talk, um, I felt that it was best to focus on a, a typical factual challenge. So a sort of a and Croydon factual challenge, which would flow from a full age assessment or, or potentially a, a short form age assessment if you're challenging it in that way, um, as opposed to challenging it on, on traditional public law grounds. Um, there are fine margins in these cases. You know, the judge at fact finding hearing is deciding the case on balance of probabilities. So preparation really is everything. And so that, that's, that, that's really the key. You need to be preparing everything so carefully. Um, and so I was thinking about the best way to, to, to talk about that today. And, uh, and I felt that, that a, a sort of fictitious case study might be the best way um, for, for us to, to, to run through it. Um, so what I've got here is a case study. I'm just going to read it out to you. Um, and then we're going to have a think about the initial steps that, that come to mind. Um, so you're contacted by Ben, a foster carer for Mohammed. Ben explains that Mohammed needs advice to challenge an age assessment of Brent Council. The age assessment has found Mohammed to be 21 rather than 17. So you arrange a meeting to see Mohammed the next day. Um, Mohammed doesn't have a copy of the age assessment. Um, he's been told it will, he will shortly be moved to adult home office accommodation. He remembers that during the interviews, he was supported by an appropriate adult from the Refugee Council. Um, and he also has the details of his immigration solicitor. So what initial steps come to mind here? So you've got a young person in front of you. He's been age assessed to be four years old, a 21 rather than 17. Um, all that you've really got, the details of the appropriate adult, his immigration solicitor, you know that it's friend council. He doesn't have the age assessment. Um, you know, he's going to be moved shortly. So, so just have a think about that. And um, really, it, it, here are the next steps that, that I would take uh, and that, that I would recommend taking. So firstly, and, and probably the most important step is, is, to, is to urgently write to the lawyers at Brent. You know, you need the age assessment document. It's a good opportunity to request the social workers notes and, and to deal with the threat of removal from care. And um, with that in mind, local authorities do take different approaches. Some local authorities will be open to the idea of the young person staying in care um, while you're preparing urgent pre-action correspondence for them to consider. Um, and sometimes you can sell that to the local authority by, by, by arguing that, well, it, you know, if, if you consider our, our pre-action letter and you want to carry out a new age assessment, you don't have to go through the ordeal of collecting him from wherever the Home Office has placed him in, in the country. Um, some local authorities are quite strict um, and, and will move the young person out immediately. And, and that, of course, put, puts more pressure on you as, as the lawyer. Um, so that's really the first thing you want to do with, deal with with Brent. Another great thing to do is to, is to straight away from the outset to request a copy of the social care file. Um, you know, they've got a month to provide the file, um, but it's good to get that request in early. Um, you know, you might receive those documents after you've had pre-action correspondence and when, when you're preparing the case for court. Um, and that might be really handy at that stage in the case to, 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 to have a look through the file and to think about, um, you know, um, potential witnesses that you might identify in the file. So teachers maybe or, or support workers. So it's a good idea to, to get that request in, um, to diarise the one month deadline um, if they go over and they, they want more time, then try to push back. Um, often local authorities will say, um, you know, we need another two months because it's complex. Um, you know, it, all that you're asking for is a copy of the social care file. You know, it, it, it's not a complex subject access request. Um, so try to push back and try to get that copy filed as quickly as possible. Um, that said, I, I wouldn't recommend delaying the case while waiting for it. I'm just saying to get that request in so, so, so you've got the ball rolling with that. 
um, contact the refugee council so they that their appropriate adult attended the interviews and um, ask for a copy of the notes um, maybe even talk to the appropriate adult um, to, 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 to see what they thought about the assessment process and and to see if they picked up on any themes or any problems um, that maybe might not have made their way into into the notes um, it's quite difficult for an appropriate adult to note down everything of course um, you've got the immigration solicitor's details so write to the immigration solicitor make sure that they're aware of your involvement um, get a copy of, of, the, of the client's immigration papers um, and I've put here especially um, documents like the welfare form the, the child welfare form or screening interview or any statement any witness statement submitted to the home office and um, the reason why those documents are important is because you know you're going to be preparing your clients challenge and and consistency and credibility is, is, is really important, obviously, in these cases. Um, so you want to see those documents and you want to potentially look at any inconsistencies while you're preparing the case. Um, but also, if you do have to issue proceedings and indeed in the course of pre-action correspondence, you need to be thinking about the duty of candor. And, you know, so, so these documents, while they might not contain information of direct relevance to age they will contain details about that young person's journey to the uk um, and 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 that 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 information is chronological in nature um, and of course age assessment is the assessment of chronological age it's, it's, it feeds in it is relevant um, what is in th th these types of documents so so get these documents from from the immigration solicitor um, and, 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 and this is something that I would also do. So, so Ben's got in contact with you, the foster carer, or, or, or even if a client's foster carer or support worker hasn't contacted you, it's, it's, it's really good in an early stage to, to speak to the people that have been looking after your client, the people that have been involved every day with your client. Um, and the, 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 reason, the reason for this is, well, that there, there's, there's a case that's particularly helpful um, it's um, called AE against uh, Croydon. Um, and um, in that case, the judge said that, that a, a lot of weight can be attached to um, an opinion of someone who has spent a long period of time with, your, with, with the young person. So trying to get an opinion from Ben here would be a very good idea. Um, at, at this early stage, you might just want to seek something informal from Ben. You know, if, if, if you, sometimes with, with a witness, if, if you straight away start asking for a witness statement, um, that can be quite daunting for them. Um, and it might be quite useful for you to get something informal because if they decide not to give formal evidence, you've got something informal to use in the process. Um, that, that, that would still be helpful to your client's case. Um, and so you might want to, to be informal to begin with, speak on the phone and, and try and get something in email to, to begin with. And explore with your client, you know, other than Ben, who's been involved a lot with you since you've been in the UK? Have you been going to school, going to college, going to any clubs? Uh, I, I don't mean um, nightclubs, um, <laughs> uh, but, but have you joined, has he joined any clubs? Um, you know, the Refugee Council has some excellent clubs. Um, you know, to football clubs and things like that. But what's what's he been doing? Um, does Ben have a partner? Has has Mohammed made any close friends? So you can really start to begin from a very early stage of the, ca the case to explore whether you can get any third party opinion um, to support your client's case. And together with your client's own evidence, you, you're you're form what you're doing is you're forming a persuasive case. Um, you know. It, 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 you're adding meat to it. Your your client's witness statement without third party support is is it, you know, it, it doesn't look quite as good. But but of course, there are many cases where you you, you don't manage to get any evidence from any third parties, and and that that's not necessarily um, the, the end of the line, but by any stretch um, of the imagination. So um, you've received um, Mohammed's age assessment document from Brent and you've had a read through it. Um, Mohammed's from Eritrea. Um, you note that during his journey to the UK, that he was in Germany for two years, um, where he was fingerprinted and claimed asylum. 
Um, you also note that Mohammed has contact with family members through WhatsApp. Um, you also read the appropriate adult notes, which record Mohammed saying that there might be a document at home showing his date of birth, although it's not reflected in the age assessment. So what, what next steps come to mind here? So here you've got the document, you've read through it. He was in Germany for two years. You know, he was involved with the authorities in Germany and um, was fingerprinted there. Um, he's got contact with his family members and there might be this document that, that, that you only picked up on that from the appropriate adult notes, but there might be this document. So the next steps that, that perhaps come to mind there. Um, so this is about his time in Germany that I thought I would deal with first. So you want to talk to him about this. He was there for two years and involved with the authorities. So, you know, the authorities will have a date of birth for him. So you'll, you'll want to speak to him about, you know, what date of birth did he provide to them? What date of birth were they using? Was he treated as a child while he was in Germany? Was he living with other children? Was he going to school? Was there any age assessment process? Was there any medical testing? You know, you want to really find out what happened while he was in Germany. And would he be willing to sign a request for information to send to the German authorities? So that would be um, under the GDPR um, uh, regulations um, under Article 15. Um, it is possible to make that, that type of request. Um, and if you do make that type, make that request, you, you know, it's best to make it early. Um, and it's best to discuss it with your client early, because if they don't want the request to be sent, then um, it's an opportunity for you to address those concerns with the client. The client might be concerned about possible impact on and how, how it may affect his asylum claim here. Um, and you, you'll want to manage your client's expectations because not requesting that information may affect his prospects of success in the case. And it might even make the case not strong enough for full legal aid funding. Um, and I, I, I say not strong enough um, because the UK doesn't have access as things stand to, to, to Eurodac. Um, so before they were able to, to, to find out what countries a young person had been fingerprinted in and claimed asylum in and what dates of birth were being used. And as a result of that, that there is a bit of, I would say, a bit of an expectancy on that young person from the upper tribunal now, when, when you're going through a fact-finding process to, to make these types of requests. Um, if, there, if there has been a lengthy period in a country, if there has been an asylum claim in a country, if he's been fingerprinted there. So the, the upper tribunal is likely to draw, in my opinion, is, is, is likely to draw adverse inference and unless um, your client is able to explain um, and justify not making um, that request. So um, th th this, this, this is something that you need to discuss with him at an early stage. Um, and it will be something that, 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 that your barrister will want to talk to you about if, 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 if you're looking at taking the case to court, um, but your client hasn't yet signed um, such a request. So speak to Mohammed. Is it possible for the age assessors to speak with your, would it, well, would it have been possible for them to speak with family members before reaching the decision? Um, and would his family members be able to confirm his age? Um, if, if so, um, so if, if, if that's the case, if the age assessors could have spoken to the family members and if they could have confirmed his age, his date of birth, um, would, would Mohammed be comfortable with arguing this in the letter before claim? And, and if the case is going to court, would Mohammed be comfortable with us contacting the family members? Uh, the, the reason that I would do it this way around is because you could, what I would probably say in a letter before claim, I, I would probably say that I, the, I haven't spoken to the family members to avoid prejudicing a potential reassessment of age. However, that we would speak to those family members if, if, if the local authority maintains its decision and if we had to bring court proceedings. Because of course, the judge will want to know um, that evidence, but, but in the same breath, it, when you're sending a pre-action letter and the, when there might be a possibility of a new age assessment, 
you, you don't want to be seen as coaching family members or prejudicing in any, in any top in any kind of way. So in terms of the document, you know, ask Mohammed to speak with his family members to see if there is a document, um, and and if so, to send that document um, through to him. Um, you you always want a photo of the document first um, before trying before exploring sending the original over because of course the original may may get lost in, in the post or um, so it's it's always a, a good idea to make sure that you have a good photo of the document at, the, at least. Um, and of course, um, at this stage of the case, you're going to be preparing a, a letter before claim. Um, you, you should plead that the decision, the age assessment decision is wrong as a question of fact, as well as arguing all of the legal flaws with reference to the Merton framework. Um, and of course, Ant Antonia has been through, um, been through some of that framework um, today. Um, so, in this case, uh, unfortunately, we have to go to court. Um, what happened is Mohammed agreed to sign the GDPR request. Uh, he was confident the German authorities had his claim date of birth. The request was sent a week ago and you're waiting for a response. Um, you use the format recommended on the ICO website, adapting it to reflect the circumstances. I've just put that in just because I think that that's generally the way that I, I do it. I, I use the template on the ICO website and and, 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 and adapt it so, so it's suitable for, for making this type of request. Meanwhile, Mohammed has been moved from care and is now accommodated with adults by, by the Home Office in Derby. Um, he's scared, he sits in his room all day and he has start, um, sharp stomach um, pains, unfortunately. Uh, Brent, meanwhile, has responded to uh, maintaining its decision um, even though Mohammed managed to obtain a photo of a medical document from his family members through WhatsApp, and the medical document shows his date of birth on it, um, which, which you had sent to Beth Brent. Um, the original document is on its way to the UK. It's been posted um, to, to your office. You've still got three months to go until limitations up. What should you do next? First of all, I think this is really important to keep time on your side um, and to act with urgency if you're going to be asking the court to act with urgency in an, in an application for interim relief. And um, e even if you're going to be asking the court for expedition um, rather than interim relief initially, if you're going to potentially ask for interim relief alongside permission, you, you're still going to want to act with urgency um, if you're going to ask the, the court to, to also act with urgency. It also it takes time to prepare these challenges. Um, you're preparing a client statement, which I'll, I'll come on to shortly. Um, but, but, but these cases do tend to be fairly front loaded. So it's really important to always keep time on your side um, and, and, and to really um, and, and, and to just be so proactive. Um, you know, it's, it's claimant work and in claimant work. It's always so important, particularly in these cases, to be so, um, so on the ball. And so you, you need to go to court. So you're going to need emergency fund, uh, legal aid funding. So uh, usually the legal aid agency would decide that within two working days. Um, but, of, but of course, keep doing everything you can beforehand under legal help. You know, does anything need chasing? Um, it really um, requires a meticulous approach to these cases. Um, because, you know, if you're successful for your client, it will pay off. Um, it will pay off for the client, of course, but it pays off for the lawyer too. Um, and so, you know, obviously we care most, of, we care about the client above everything, um, but, um, it, it, you know, it, pay, it pays off for everyone to, to, to make sure that we, we do everything we can, um, you know, um, even while we're waiting for funding to come through. And once funding is in place, get, get council instructed straight away um, and then work together as, as much as possible on, on the case. Um, perhaps just one thing on, on funding, um, the legal aid agency sometimes um, does um, reject um, these types of applications. Um, their decisions can be a little bit random. Um, and when you apply on an emergency basis, you can challenge the emergency refusal um, by review. If you do that, then make sure that you contact the legal aid agency to make sure your review challenge is going to be dealt with urgently. Um, if they reject it again on review, you can apply again for an emergency certificate. Um, 
perhaps at some stage, sometimes if the legal aid agency has been difficult, then it can be useful to get council's advice um, to, 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 to help with the application process. It, usually um, there's a small team at the legal aid agency that deals with these types of applications. And once they get to know you, um, that they, they usually start granting your applications without any problem. Um, but, but sometimes they can be a little bit difficult. Um, what I find um, when I'm dealing with the legal aid agency um, is to, to make sure that you address um, why there are grounds of challenge, notwithstanding the local authority's response to the pre-action letter. It's really important that you address their response to the pre-action letter and that you make it clear to the legal aid agency that, um, that it's not just the flaws in the age assessment, but it's also your client's positive factual case and that you'll be preparing a witness statement for your client um, to, 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 to give him um, a, a, a factual case that will have at least moderate prospects of success. So preparing your client's evidence for court. So the FZ permission test, um, be bearing that in mind, that the, 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 the stronger your client's factual case is, the better chance there is of permission being granted. So, you know, it's, it's all about your client's factual case um, when, you, when you're looking at permission. If, if you don't put in a witness statement, it, 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 you know, it's going to be difficult to prove that your client has, has a half decent factual case. And um, so you're, you're going to want to prepare a, a detailed witness statement. And I, I've always found that that's the best way to deal with an age assessment case, to prepare that detailed witness statement at the beginning of the case, and then to supplement it with further witness statement evidence during the upper tribunal fact-finding process. So the witness statement is going to want to work chronologically through Mohammed's life, um, hopefully so it supports when read from the round the age he claims to be. Um, so the way that I tend to do it is to use headings to help break up the statement. So, um, you know, a heading that deals with his life so far, and that could have subheadings. Um, so his, his life in Eritrea, um, why he had to leave, his journey to the UK, um, and that makes it a bit easier for the judge to read. Um, and then the next section could be about how he knows his age and date of birth and the next section about the problems during the age assessment, and the next section um, about why he's asking the court to, to essentially to, to grant him an, an interim relief order. Um, and so I, I think that, that that really helps to focus the witness statement. Um, there are different approaches to drafting a witness statement. Some people like to um, collate all of the factual information from all of the documents and try to sort of prepare a a kind of draft to, to then um, build on with the client or and to talk about different issues with the client. And some solicitors like just to sit with the client and get all of the information from them, really starting from scratch. And that, that does, of course, involve them going through things again, but it, but it ensures that things aren't missed and then you can compare um, what you've managed to, to obtain from the client alongside um, what, what's, what's in those other documents. And, and you might have to then clarify some things with him. Um, but I do think that whatever approach you take, you know, it's important to make sure the detail is there. Um, and obviously it's important to make sure that it is um, his account. Um, you know, he's going to be cross-examined at trial over this. Um, so, you know, it needs to be, it needs to be the truth or it needs to be his account um, and not, not something that, 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 that you think fits nicely. Um, and if something, if his account doesn't doesn't fit nicely, then then that feeds into the prospects of, of the case and potentially um, might mean that it's not strong enough to take to court. Um, you know, it's, it's, you, you can't change the facts. Um, so if possible to speak with Mohammed's family members. Um, so we know the case is going to court. Um, so, um, we'll, you know, the local authority is not doing a reassessment. So we want to try and speak with his family members now. Um, and we could set that out within a witness statement from ourselves to say exactly what that discussion consisted of. Um, so that information is before the court, again, helping Mohammed, Mohammed's factual case. So this, the next bit is to follow up with third parties or to 
or to pursue other third parties um, who might be able to to give helpful evidence. Um, so you know you might have something from Ben, you you might have something from a teacher, you might have something from a support worker. Um, you know you might have picked up on something else in the social care file, or or Mohammed might have might have told you about a close friend that he's made. Um, you know while you're while you're building that case of course you want to see whether anyone else um, could help provide to provide um, supportive evidence at that stage um, again you might want to talk to them informally first um, uh, perhaps on the phone see, see see what they have to say potentially first um, um, and um, and and just just keep keep that keep that under tabs. So, so so you know whenever you're working on your client's case, um, you know is there anything else that you could obtain um, from anyone else working with him? Um, has he started um, working with any new um, individuals? Um, you know, for instance, in Derby, he's been moved to he's in Derby at the moment. Is there, is anyone working with him there? So at this stage, you're ready to issue that your client's case, of course. You've done his witness statement. Barrister agrees it needs to be issued as quickly as possible. Um, you know it, it's urgent. We're going to apply for interim relief. Um, you haven't heard back from Germany, um, but you've still got a couple of weeks to go until until the one month deadline lapses. Um, and and you know GDPR requests sometimes take longer, unfortunately, um, for, for responses to come in. Um, you're you're still waiting for the medical document from Eritrea. Um, but you know, councils addressed it, all of these matters in the statement of facts and grounds. You know, the case is, is ready to get it go into court. Um, you're preparing the the claim form, the application for urgent consideration, and the bundle. So um, there are a few considerations um, when preparing those documents. Um, the N four six three application. Um, you know. It, that there, that there was a sort of a damning judgment against a, another law firm, um, and it, you know it's not acceptable just to just to refer to the paragraphs in the statement of facts and grounds. You know the N four six three needs to contain um, your client's um, application for interim relief, um, so a judge can decide that application essentially based on that form, um, and also it needs to set out. Um, what type, what what arguments uh, your opponent uh, may have to resist the application? Um, you know, it being an ex parte application, that th those issues need to be put put to the court as well, and 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 you can obviously uh, address them, um, and and definitely um, speak with counsel about the N four six three. Make sure that it's make sure that it's um, adequate and 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 it has enough detail. Um, there's new practice directions for judicial review about preparing the bundle um, and, um, and, and seeking interim relief. So make sure that you've um, checked the practice directions and that you're um, hopefully um, meeting all of them. And then um, com complying with the duty of candor. So it's in section 14 of the admin court guidance. Um, and of course, Getting documents from the immigration solicitor, making sure that relevant documents are there um, in your application bundle um, is, is important. Those documents will to be disclosed. So you've issued your case at court and you want to have a break, but um, unfortunately, um, you, you, uh, well, I say unfortunately, I suppose it's fortunately because you've received Mohammed's original medical document from Eritrea. Um, and you realise that you that the, that the court really needs to know about this um, uh, because you know they're going to decide into relief, um, and one of the issues the court might think about is the strength of the case when looking at the balance of convenience. And so, you know, you want to make sure the court is aware of this. So you decide to send it to the court, um, and you copy, and of course, of course, you copy in the other side. Um, then you receive an order from the court. You, 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 you know your application for interim relief has been granted, um, and and Brent has fourteen days for to 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 put in its acknowledgement of service and, and grounds of defence. Um, and obviously you're delighted because of it's very difficult to get interim relief orders, um, and um, particularly if if you're applying um, w without giving the opponent an opportunity to to put his case to the court. Um, and, and and as Antonia touched on. Um, 
it's it you usually you would want to give the opponent an opportunity to to to, to argue its case um and and unless you can justify a particular urgency it's often a good idea to have interim relief decided alongside the permission application so Mohammed is returned to Brent's care. Um, he, he's given, he's placed at a semi-independent placement this time. So not back with the foster care, he's placed at a semi-independent placement. Two weeks later, Brent puts in his, his AOS and grounds of defense. Um, you don't like some of their argument and council drafts a reply and um, which you file and serve. A week later, um, you're, you've been granted permission and you've been transferred to the upper tribunal. And of course you pay the, um, the continuation fee um, of 770 within the seven day deadline to avoid disaster. Um, so now you're before the upper tribunal. Uh, standard directions are issued, um, which um, Antonia um, summarized. Um, Meanwhile, you've, you've been chasing Germany for a response to the GDPR request, and you've just received an email attaching a 39 page document, and most of it's in, Ger in the German language. Mohammed's date of birth within the document is the 1st of the 1st, 1998, and um, his claim date of birth is the 29th of December 2003, which is supported by the original medical document. So what should you do next? So you're going to want to obtain a, a translation, a translations of those 39 pages, um, first and foremost, and then review that with, with counsel. Um, and you, you realise in Mohammed's case that he's, he was always treated as an adult asylum seeker by the German authorities using that date of birth. You're going to want to speak to Mohammed about that. Um, and think about whether he needs another statement um, to accompany that disclosure um, to, to the upper tribunal and to the opponent. Now, of course, the, the opponent and the upper tribunal don't have this material yet, and, and it, it is perfectly acceptable to, to, you know, once you receive material like this, to get it translated and speak to the client about it. Um, of course, it does need to be disclosed, but um, that, you know, Often it needs to be disclosed in the right context, sometimes with a, with, with a witness statement from, from your client. Um, and at this stage, you're going to want to also think about the possibility of expert evidence um, in relation to the asylum processes in Germany, um, which, which might um, in, in, inform us a bit on why this date of birth is there. Um, you know, it's the first of the first. Um, which which might be relevant in, in some way, um, and and expert evidence potentially in relation to the medical document, um, which might be from a country expert. And so you're you're going to want to think with think about the possibility of expert evidence with with your barrister, um, and 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 you you want to think about this, um, um, you know, not not just expert evidence but other types of evidence. So. You know, if, if, if Mohammed uh, was treated at a hospital in Germany while he was there, um, or he was treated in another country or whatever, you know, you might want to seek documents from, from, from that organisation. So you, you've put in another witness statement for Mohammed, and you've, you've exhibited the GDPR material, the translations, and you've put, you've put in his further evidence on the point. Um, so you do this within a couple of days, I mean, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, um, because you, you, want, you want to make sure that, that you comply with the duty of candor. Um, other than the possibility of expert evidence, what other considerations might you have at this stage of the case? So can I obtain any further helpful witness statement evidence to file and serve by the direction deadline? Is there anything else that you could get? And I would just add, on that front, I would continue until the fact-finding trial to try and get helpful witness statement evidence from third parties. Um, if you do manage to get something, you can just apply to the upper tribunal and for, 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 for permission for it to be adduced. And you know, it's material that's going to help inform um, the trial judge to help the trial judge to make a decision. So I would expect the upper tribunal to allow that witness statement to, to go in. 
Um, that, that said, um, it's really important that, you, that, that, you, that, that these directions are treated very seriously. The upper tribunal is strict about them. So, so do, do work to those deadlines of getting evidence in. Um, and, um, but, but if anything does come up later, um, that then of course, to, to don't think that it's, it's, it's impossible to put before the upper tribunal. And um, so Mohammed, in, in Mohammed's case, he's been back in Brent's care for a period of time and it's a different placement. So you might want to speak to the on-site support workers, see if they've got an opinion. Um, again, trying to talk to them informally potentially first, um, trying to get something like in an email, something um, you know, in writing first before looking at the possibility of a formal statement. Again, something is better than nothing. Um, and in, in, some, in some of my cases where I've managed to get something in writing um, or, or I've managed to get something from a third party, but that third party hasn't been willing to, uh, pr to provide formal evidence, um, I, I, I prepared a statement to, from myself exhibiting um, those emails and, and also the, the emails where the third party explains why they, they don't want to give formal witness evidence. Just say the upper tribunal, just say the trial judge can decide to put weight on that material and can look at that the, the, the person's reasons for not wanting to get involved in the case. Um, it, for instance, it might be that the on-site support worker has been told by the local authority not to get involved, and in which case that's of course relevant to, to, to your client's case and, 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 and would help you to invite the judge to place greater weight um, on, on that email. Um, because the, the local authority essentially has frustrated the cross-examination of that witness. So hopefully you've also been pestering Brent to make sure his needs are met. Um, you know, hopefully he's in some sort of college or, or whatever at, at the moment, um, because you've got interim relief, they need to treat him as a child. Um, and then so there might be a tutor that you could approach for an opinion on the matter. And tutors, can be quite good people to approach in these cases because they can they can talk about uh, you know how that young person compares to others in the class um so um, um that that can be a good approach to take of course um, um not not during covid but hopefully um now um with uh, with students uh, back at back at college and back at back at school um that can hopefully um, be helpful um and speak Take further instructions from Mohammed. Um, you know, um, th th make sure you talk to your client um, fairly regularly. Um, look at the social care file material. Is there a, is there anything else we could do to help his case? You know, he, he might have some ideas um, of, of who we could approach or of what, what we could do to help his case. And it's his case and we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can um, for him. And here, um, I, I've added about sending without prejudice correspondence, inviting Brent to concede the claim um, when considering his witness statement and the documentary evidence. Um, but I would add, and, and, and Helen, Helen's right, that, that, that we need to be doing this um, quite often throughout a case. Um, I, I would say that there, there are probably four moments during a case that you, you might want to think about writing to the opponent um, to, to, to try to get them to think about the possibility of settlement. Uh, local authorities don't really, I find, don't tend to think about it until quite late in the day. Um, but I think that, that, that you could um, write to them um, first once you've issued your client's case. Um, you could write to them that the second time that, that you could write to them would be, could be when permission has been granted. The third time, um, once you've exchanged further witness statement evidence. And then the final time, um, the fourth time in the lead up to the fact finding hearing. So I would say that those are the, probably the four sensible times to try to see if there can be any constructive discussion on the possibility of, of settling this case um, without going to um, a fact finding hearing, which is a risk for your client, but also of course, a risk for the local authority um, because there's a litigation risk for them um, as well. Uh, you know, of course, they want to get these decisions right, but they need to also, and they'd also be thinking about the costs um, or that they would that would be involved if they were to lose the, the case. 
So how the story ends for Mohammed, uh, you'll be pleased to hear that he goes on to win his case following the fact-finding hearing. And, uh, and that brings my section of the talk to an end. Thank you so much, Ed, that was really helpful. Um, we have a little bit of time left to go, but of course, I'm conscious that people have things to get onto. Um, we've had a couple of questions in the chat, but firstly, I just wanted to pick up on something that Ed um, mentioned in relation to the preparation of Mohammed's claim, which is about Article 15 GDPR requests. I think this is quite an interesting point that developed in the last 12 months or so. Um, and of course, prior to Brexit, as I mentioned, local authorities were able to request the UK Dublin unit to make what was called an Article 39 request for information from another EU country um, and or kind of request the applicant themselves do so. There was a debate going on as to whether that was lawful in line with the Dublin procedures, but you know that chapter has closed and no point to dwell on it. But I think it, it has led to a couple of interesting points that have risen in a number of cases that might just be useful to touch on. The first is whether an applicant can be compelled to make an Article 15 GDPR request. Um, and secondly, whether they should consent to the local authority making that request on their behalf. I think these, both of these points have um, arisen in different cases. And the upper tribunal hasn't really grappled with it. And I think there is one case where they did require a young person to make an Article 15 request. Um, of course, Article 15 is all about the right to obtaining your personal data. And I think it's a point that's kind of rife for determination, maybe later down the line and maybe in the Court of Appeal where, where there's a particular case where adverse inferences have been drawn. Um, and there is scope under GDPR to compel someone to make a GDPR request, a subject access request. Um, but I think there's, it's doubtful whether that kind of arises in age dispute cases. Looking at the second point, I think sometimes local authorities have requested that they make the request on a young person's behalf. I, mean, I would resist that if I were you at, at kind of all costs. I don't think it's proportionate um, to do so. And also under what's Article 15 of GDPR, there's a right to rectification. So if a young person says that their personal data is incorrect um, and they want it to be correct, corrected, they have a right to do so. Um, and I think it, it's kind of arguable that um, it doesn't, you know, it kind of either prejudices them um, if that information is disclosed to the tribunal and to their opponent before they've had an opportunity to go through that process. Um, so I think if you do have those kinds of issues, it's very sensible to take you know, strong advice on it um, and just think very carefully through the process and whether you want to resist. I mean, in some cases, a young person may be happy to make the request if they're satisfied that um, the data is going to be helpful for them. Um, I did have a case where a young woman who had been the victim of very serious sexual assault in a European country refused, saying, I just can't countenance the idea of signing anything or anything that relates to that country and kind of thought that they may be sent back there. Um, so it does raise some kind of tricky points that I think, as Ed probably says, it's just sensible to grapple with at the kind of early stages. Um, so as I said, we've had two um, helpful questions in the chat. One we've answered, oh, actually, I think now three. Um, one we've answered, but I thought it may be helpful just to deal with it with the group, um, which was from Rebecca about whether the Home Office can force a young person to undergo an age assessment if social services have accepted age and themselves don't wish, wish to complete the assessment. Um, and Helena, I wonder if I could pass that to you first. Sure. Um, well, the Home Office can't uh, technically force uh, anybody to undergo an age assessment, the young person or the local authority. Um, but from a pragmatic standpoint, when that arises, we will often ask a local authority simply to complete a pro forma um, template and send back to the Home Office uh, because the local authority in taking responsibility for that child will already be conducting a range of interviews, assessments, planning with that child. So we'll be gathering information anyway uh, and can use um, a minimum amount of that to just put onto a pro forma to send to the Home Office to say that they're satisfied with the information they have that, that, that this is indeed a child. Uh, I think very often the Home Office isn't actually interested to that much in what's in that reformer, they just want to tick a box to say that something's happened so they can move on. Of course, they will occasionally the Home Office might come back and query that, but in most, in almost, in my experience, Home Office just wants to tick a box. So as long as the social worker fills in that form, sends it off to them, everybody's happy. Mm. And I think um, a further point that I um, put in the chat is in relation to kind of guidance that informs this and what Helen's described. So kind of asking the local authority to, to put something um, in writing is consistent with what's said in the ADCS guidance. So that helps social workers to kind of be empowered 
to go back and resist, um, it's page five of the guidance if you ever need to look it up, kind of resist the Home Office request to conduct an ass assessment that says they should negotiate with the Home Office and explain why they should be treated as a child or conduct an assessment that's sufficiently comprehensive to enable the Home Office to kind of be assured that something's being conducted. Um, and I think a further point that's helpful to note is from the joint working guidance, so the one between the Home Office and local authorities, that has a specific process for dealing with how to manage conflicting age assessments or disputes. Um, and that's all geared, so if you imagine Home Office thinks one thing or doesn't accept a local authority assessment, um, and the local authority, for example, is happy that someone's a child, it's all geared towards collaboration and coming to mutual agreement. Um, and so you could always guide the Home Office back if some, a dispute is coming later down the line, um, you could always guide them back to say, well, this is the process that escalates through head of children's services um, that should be followed if there's a dispute, but it doesn't mean that a young person should be put through an age assessment unnecessarily. And again, that comes from the ADCS guidance that obviously it's you know, traumatizing, potentially re-traumatizing, um, or doesn't assist with the relationships with professionals to put through individuals if there's no purpose for the age assessment. Ed, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, yeah, that's perfect. Thanks. Um, so the final question that we had um, was for Lynn, thank you, saying, should information from a short form assessment be shared with a young person if a full age assessment is done at a later stage? Ed, do you want to pick that one up? Well, I, 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 I mean, I would like to think that the, the, the young person already knows about the um, information in a short form assessment. Um, mm -hmm you know that they, they should really know if they've been short form assessed and and and, and what, what the reasons are were against that young person at that time um of course though if, if you've gone on to uh, fully assess and accept that young person's age then you're trying to rebuild that relationship um and in those circumstances there may not be a need to, to also um you know discuss the the short form decision um that hasn't been that hasn't um that hasn't been the final decision in any event. Yeah, and I think that kind of comes back to some of the principles that are at the end of the kind of list in A, B and Kent, um, that essentially, you know, young person should be informed about the reasons for a decision. So often that can happen verbally at the end, whether it's a short form assessment or a full assessment, but then a, a kind of report should be provided promptly and that should apply whether or not the short, you know, the local authority then goes on to conduct a further assessment or they just stop at the short form assessment. And um, so I think, yes, you know, it is important that, that they have access to any any assessment and any reasons that have been relied upon. Helen, did you want to add anything? I think it perfect. I think that's all questions answered. Um, thank you both very much. Um, thank you all very much for attending. As we've said, um, there will be a um, recording of this full seminar and there'll also be a copy of the PowerPoint which contains in it quite a lot of the hyperlinks to the cases and the policy guidance that we referred to. Um, and there'll also be a transcript if that assists um, individuals that can be available on request if you contact our events team. Um, but thank you very much all and have a very good evening. Thank you.